Hello. Hello and welcome to Club Class, the show that says welcome to Club Class at the beginning of the show. And uh, what, what, one of the things about doing this job when you're on the radio is to make the audience at home feel as comfortable as the audience in the room and to make them feel like the same sort of effect as if they were here. But unfortunately, if you're listening at home and there's your house stinks of disinfectant, you're not <laughs> going to get that effect that we have here at the Zap Club. We were going to start off tonight with a little karaoke competition and get everyone out of the audience up and singing and everything like that. But we've tried it before and Milli Vanilli win every week, so we're not going to bother with that. <laughs> now, if, you, if you're listening to this, I, I want to give a little bit of a tip to everyone that's, that's listening, and that is to go to Notting Hill Carnival. If you can make it at, at August Bank Holiday every year, or September Bank Holiday, depending when they have it, go to Notting Hill Carnival. It's the best fun you can have any time of year. And it's, it's fun, because like, it's a carnival, and it'll always attract hippies for some reason. Even though it's a West Indian carnival, there's always going to be a lot of hippies there. And there's, you get things like the crash with the hippie kids passing around sweet cigarettes and things like that, you know, and going, yeah, this is real Lebanese saccharine, man. Yeah, this is brilliant. <laughs> and you get portaloos like at every, uh, every festival. And portaloos, I don't know if you've ever been into one. I if you go into any portaloo, anyway, even on a building site, you go into a portaloo and the first step you take, there's a big pile of vomit as you walk in. <laughs> And apparently no one's done that, it's just when you build a portaloo, they're built in to get the atmosphere going, you know. <laughs> and you hop over that, you hop over the pile of vomit, and the next step you take, there's always a stinky hippie stood next to you. And he's never actually using the toilet, he just likes it in there, you know, he thinks it's a zap club or something, I don't know. <laughs> but the best thing about not in here, it's a good time anyway, but the best thing is watching the plainclothes police trying to look black. <laughs> and you can always spot them, I'm great at spotting them because their skin's a different colour. <laughs> I get that straight away, you know. And it is good fun, because every year they try and dress like black people and mingle in with the crowd and think that no one's noticed. And they, always, they try and wear these clothes they think black people are wear, but they haven't really got a clue. Like, so it's like some years you'll get them in like dreadlock wigs or something like that. Or uh, one year pinstripe flares, because it's in a 1973 Jimmy Cliff video, you know, things like that. <laughs> and the best year I ever saw was last year, when you'd see 20 blokes on the street corner, obviously playing clothes police, because they all had exactly the same clothes on, they're all trying to mingle in. And, all, and someone had obviously copped up in the headquarters, they had all these t-shirts that I think were supposed to say Bob Marley. And they all have pictures of Robert Morley on their shirt and Jar Liv on the back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to bring on tonight's guest artist, Eddie Izzard, who won last year's Perrier Commendation at Edinburgh, and is also the resident compere at London's Raging Bull Club in Soho. Welcome onto the stage, Eddie Izzard! <laughs> I know you don't actually know me, but if you did, I know you would have applauded a lot louder, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay, you know, because well, we can't really know everyone otherwise, you know. Right, well, good evening. Um, uh, yes, well, what we're all gathered here for, I asked you here tonight, because um, uh, my autobiography, it's out now, it's in the bookshops, and this is going with uh, the plugging of my autobiography. It's called um, Eddie is of the Wilderness Years, and... Uh, <laughs> It's on sale. You know you hear about books advertised in all good bookshops, but uh, I'm selling them in the bad bookshops as well. Um, you know, the ones with just three books in and an elephant, you know, and a couple of cheese rolls. And, and the guy going, I don't know of a bad bookshop. I'll have a bad time. Got the elephant in the bag and it all went downhill. And he's too big and he ate a lot of the books. And, and the cheese rolls didn't really sell. And, uh, a bad bookshop, really. We're trying to come up as an indifferent bookshop, but <laughs> one day I'll be a good bookshop. Perhaps I should just be a good elephant shop. That would be much better. <laughs> and so we had the launch last night, and I'm look. I know you think I'm looking a bit wrecked. Oh, it was terrible. I know. Well, it's big, you know, <laughs> celebration thing. Uh, everyone was there. Um, no, they weren't. And. Um, <laughs> Just me. Well, well, we went out. Yeah. <laughs> it was party time. I mean, I went down the pub, had a few jars, you know, and uh, then we went off down another pub, had a few jars, and then we all ended up back at my place and had a few more jars. And, and after that, I thought, whew, that's enough jam for me. It's <laughs> ended, isn't it? Yeah. I know. No, no, not driving. It's all right. I, uh, <laughs> When you can't throw it up, it's too heavy. It just goes, hoo, hoo, and it gets up as far as your neck, you know. You don't, in the morning, you don't have a hangover, you have a hangunder, really. It's sort of, it's sort of a different thing. And um, you wake up in the morning, your head's completely clear, but your bottom's backed up for a couple of months. And you're saying, yeah, you can shout, but don't push me, all right? 
the gel goes in and comes out the same consistency. It's quite nice, that, you know. Uh, colour change in the middle. And when you read the biography, because it's being serialised in, uh, in, um, in my dustbin, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll read, you know, I had a difficult childhood, because, um, you know, we had to escape, our family had to escape from Nazi Germany in 1937, um, because my father was Liberal Party candidate in Munich um, <laughs> during the 33 elections there, you know, it was a bit off the wall. Um, he was standing jobs, pensions, freedom of speech, good liberal values. And he was up against Hermann Goering, who was standing on the vote for me or I'll kill you, you know, kind of <laughs> to get, um, good Nazi values. And uh, we were losing hands down at the time, and uh, we had to escape. And so my mother, she took me down to the banks of the Rhine, the river that runs through Germany. And from the river bank, she took some reeds, and uh, she took some mud with it. And together, she shaped them into the shape of a U-boat. <laughs> And placed me inside, and I, I floated off down the river, and that was the last, you know, I saw my parents. And I was brought up after that by wolves, actually. Uh, uh, they were out yachting one day, and, uh, and it was great being brought up by wolves. They gave a wonderful time, you know, they gave me a name, they called me Err, I think. And uh, they taught me how to hunt and how to fish and how to play backgammon. Oh, it was brilliant, you know. And wolves are just natural, at, you know, at fishing. They just wait, you know, the animals have got a sense, and they just wait by fast-flowing rivers. Uh, and then when a big fish comes along just at the right moment, they reel it in really, really quickly. <laughs> and land it with a net, you know, cook it gas mark for Brilliant stuff, you know. And we were wolves, we were young, we were crazy, you know. We, <laughs> we made love, and... Uh, <laughs> No, no, that's wrong. No. no we, we were hunting, that's it. We were hunting all the time. We were hunting, hunting, hunting. We were singing our hunting song. I'm a hunting wolf. And we were, and we were running. We were chasing antelope. Run, 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 run after the antelope. And it was great, you know. Well, there were really 19 wolves and me, and I was going, woof, woof, woof. <laughs> blend, blend, you know. Just like, <laughs> and these bears would come by and say, uh, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I'd say, hi, I'm a wolf. <laughs> Can't you tell the old wolf type, you know? <laughs> Catch you later. <laughs> and we'd be running for ages. We know the antelope really pulling away, so we'd have a discussion and agree to run in the same direction as the antelope as well. <laughs> that really helped. And re I just couldn't keep up with them. You know, because wolves, like, four legs between them, you know, and look, they've got four legs each. They've got, got four, no, they've got four legs each, not four legs between them. Four legs between them is you know, it's one leg every five wolves, you know. <laughs> I don't mean that, right? So, right, I don't mean that. Because that'd be stupid, you know. Because then you'd have one wolf on one leg, hopping, dragging four wolves <laughs> on s strings behind him, which isn't quite as an efficient hunting method as this. So I don't mean that one, right? They had four legs each, and I really couldn't keep up with them, you know, so I took to driving a small red car, you know. <laughs> and it was great, you know, it was, it was a hatchback, it was quite roomy, you know, so I said, guys, guys, get in the back. <laughs> and I turned the fan up full, you know, so their ears were flowing back. <laughs> and, Wonderful, you know. And these bears came by, and I said, don't ask. <laughs> Catch you later. <laughs> And we were really gaining on them. Now the gamble, they're bouncing up and down. Oh God, they're catching up with them. I was winding down the window saying, get the gun, guys. <laughs> oh, we're wolves, we don't have guns, do we? So all I could do was I could catch up with them and I'd lean out the window and go, Err! <laughs> That's my name. <laughs> and this is all up in the jungles of northern Germany, as you'll know from A-level geography. And, uh, Amazing animals up there, like the kookaburra, big green bird, six foot three, dark hair, and you know how birds have warning cries, the territorial thing, you know, all birds do this, and the kookaburra's got a very distinctive one, you know, it just sounds something like, Oi! What are you doing here? And, and we used to fight all the time, it was rough and tumble of the jungle, you know, and uh, it was gang fights, really, and we used to fight the sharks up in the Baltic, and... We all had gang names, that was the idea. The sharks were called the sharks, because <laughs> they're sharks. And uh, we wolves, of course, were called the jets. <laughs> and we'd go down to the beach and we'd taunt the sharks and say, Hey, you sharks! 
Yes, you with the fins on. <laughs> You're not very nice at all. <laughs> <laughs> and that would get them pissed off, you know. And they'd gnash their teeth together in that way that sharks can't do. And, and they'd rush right up onto the beach and die. <laughs> Quite tragic, really. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I had to get out of there in the end. And, uh, really, I was brought up mainly by in, in, in this town called Bexhill on Sea, which, um, <laughs> well, it's an infamous town now. And uh, the best way to describe Bexhill, for people who don't really know what it is, is by describing Eastbourne, which is better known than Bexhill. Eastbourne, south, it's south coast of Britain, it's one of those little coastal towns. Um, Eastbourne. People live their lives, they retire, they move to Eastbourne. Then they live a little bit longer. And then they die. And then they move to Bex Hill, right? <laughs> it is. You know if you've been there. I mean, there's just no kids there at all. No one to play with. When I was growing up, I had to play with Mrs. Stevens, who was, who was 76, you know? It was ding dong, hello, Mrs. Stevens. You coming out to play? No, no, hello. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Remember, you're in my gang, remember? Oh, sorry, I'm not too over, haven't I? Just hang in there. Um, look, it's Kiss Chase we're playing, yeah. Ki yeah, you don't need your teeth, go and take them out. Um, kiss Chase, you're it, you've got to chase me, right? You're it, come on, chase me. Yeah, take another step, that's good, right? And we go up to my bedroom, we put on rock and roll records and dance all night long. Yeah, it was great. We, well, I was young, we were crazy. We did nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was great. I had a gang as well, you know, a great kids' gang. Uh, well, I was a kid, they were not quite so young. But uh, we played kids' games like doorbells. Remember that? Where you ring the doorbell, then everyone runs and hides behind bushes, and the guy comes to the door, no one's there. <laughs> He's pissed off. Yeah. It's a great game, but uh, no one in my gang could move, you know? <laughs> It took us about half an hour to get up the pathway, and uh, then I'd get everyone ready, and I'd ring the doorbell, and everyone would just stand there. <laughs> the guy would come to the door, we'd go in and have a cup of tea. <laughs> Slightly different. But I wanted to live on the edge, do a bit of shoplifting, that was the idea. So we all went and hung around the chemist shop one day. There were six of us, three of us in wheelchairs, two of us on walking frames, and uh, me on a pogo stick, you know? <laughs> Just trying to blend in with metal, right? <laughs> and the guys in the wheelchairs doing wheelies, looking hard. <clears throat> the guys in the walking frames doing nothing. <laughs> and then when no one was looking, we were looking very casual, just blending in, as you do. And when no one was looking, we'd run off with all the anus oil cream in the building, you know? <laughs> it's great for your anus. <laughs> Their bowels move faster than they did, it was true. <laughs> I used to go backwards down the street. Oh, my bowels are getting away with it, you know. Um, we used to play that kids game, racing your bowels down the street. You remember that? And you get your bowels out and you put them on the floor, yeah? And then you get a long stick and you push them down the street. The Victorian kid used to do it with big hoops, you know. And uh, we'd do it with, and there'd be six of us going, oh, I'm winning. Da, 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 da. And the first over the line would win all the bowels. Remember that? And you'd go, oh, ooh, spares, you know. Up your bottom there, there. Everyone else say, ooh, cost me bag for me, please. <laughs> yep, shopping bag, that will do. There we go. Uh, you probably played the same game. Just now. But Mrs. Stevens, she, unfortunately, she died about, uh, about 10 years ago now. She died in her sleep. Uh, we're expecting it, really, because she was kipping on the M62 at the time. <laughs> it's just not the way to do it, is it? You know? But it was great, because the way I was brought up, my, my grandparents, you know, they brought me up really, they were sort of religious and, uh, well, a lot of stand-ups, a lot of people doing stand-up these days, and a lot of stand-ups are actually uh, of the Catholic faith, just statistically it happens to be true, and that is really quite good when it comes to stand-up, because you can talk all about stuff. the Catholic faith, heavy duty, you can rail against the guilt thing that goes on, you know, all the, the, all the Jewish faith, and you can talk about the oppression, you get the Holocaust, you know, all this stuff. But I was brought up Church of England. <laughs> and that's useless, it really is. You say, oh, I was brought up Church of England. When I was a kid, they used to say to me, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, oh, oh, they used to say, always wear an anorak, right? <laughs> and wrap up warm, you know? 
and that's it. It just, it, it's a real spongy religion, you know. There's just nothing in it, and it was entirely useless to me. But, you know, I used to go to, have to, I was forced to go to church at gunpoint, and they used to read all the Bible stories, and some of the Bible stories are really funny. You know, because remember, the, the classic one, the three wise men. We all know this one, uh, the nativity thing. I underline wise at this point, three wise men. Because apparently the three wise men, they said, uh, yes, we are three wise men. We are, hello, and uh, we are getting on camels and we're going to follow a star. So they follow the star all night, all night we follow the star. And then the sun comes up in the morning and they go, oh, has it gone? Uh, I mean, three stupid men, really, weren't they? Three wise men. I mean, three wise men get a mat and say, look, there it is, Bethlehem. We're going by the B491 and left at the traffic lights. Three stupid men say, we will get on camels and follow that. Which star is it? It was that one, wasn't it? No, it's, that's your torch. What are you talking about? Don't poke me with that. We must hide. All during the day, when the sun was up, they must have hid under a tarball and say, we must hide, otherwise we'll get caught out. They'll know we're the three stupid men if we come out. We must retain our dignity, the three wise men. Hide, Steve and Dano. Hide, we must hide them. So anyway, somehow they got to Bethlehem. <laughs> More by luck than judgment. And probably someone showed them a map, you know. This is true, this is how it happened. And uh, they got to Bethlehem, and there was the baby G in the Virgin M, and uh, in the big stable. And it was great. The three wise men come in, and, and he's the uh, baby G. Hello, I'm baby G. Uh, and uh, <laughs> says, hi, we're three wise men, apparently. Hello, yes. We have brought you gifts, baby G. We have brought you, I have brought you gold. Now, gold, still a groovy stuff. Everyone's using it today. And baby G's like, oh, man, this is gold. Yes, very nice, yes. <laughs> Buy a lot of Smarties with this, mother. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. You're very nice. Now, number two. Wise man number two's going to Hi, I'm wise man number two. It was all his fault. Um, <laughs> no, I am wise man and I have brought you frankincense. I think frankincense is the equivalent of Old Spice today. <laughs> because Old Spice is advertised every Christmas time. Have you noticed that? There's a spear tie in there somewhere. And Baby G going, Ah, oh, man, man, this is frankincense. It's nice. I'll splash this on all over, get down the disco. Yes, that will be very nice. Thank you very much. Now, wise man number three. Wise man number three, of course, he's the tallest, the biggest, and the tallest of them all. And he says, hi, I'm quite tall, and <laughs> I am traveled a long way, the wise man, the third wise man, and I have brought you myrrh. <laughs> what is myrrh? <laughs> I mean, it hasn't really caught on in a big way, has it? <laughs> you can't even get myrrh in the body shop. <laughs> That does seem to mean it probably doesn't exist, doesn't it? Because they do have everything at the body shop. You go in there just for something ordinary and you say, ooh, what's this on the shelf? Strawberry butter grub. <laughs> no, I don't know any human being who uses that. Uh, what's it, apricot knee enhancer? No. Is it shampoo, do you do is it shampoo? What's this, hair salad? <laughs> with onions and chives uh, and just, well, you know, wash the... And then you, you see the tester there, free stuff, and you go, oh, got to go to the tester, and then you go, shh, I'm an orange. Uh, shh, I'm an apricot. Uh, shh, I'm a bowl of fruit. And, and no one will ever sleep with you after that. Have you noticed that? But, it, you know, it's really good. The good thing about body shop, they don't test their stuff on animals, but I don't think they test it on anything, do they? <laughs> Well, you know, we're, not, we're a bit unsure about this. We'd like a bit of confirmation. They're just like, what's that blue stuff coming out the wall? Oh, all oh, right, we'll put it in a bottle. There we go. <laughs> Call it blue stuff. There we go. It's so, like with chives. There we go. <laughs> or perhaps they test it. They do test it, but on something odd, like, like, like a banjo. <laughs> just get the back of a banjo and put some on there. And we're testing on banjos. Blank, blank, blank. Now that's all right. There we go. <laughs> Blue stuff, blank, 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 no, it's all right. It's all tested, madam, yes, it'll be fine, blank, blank, blank. No, no, that's wrong, no. So I don't mean that one, right, because that'd be stupid, you know. <laughs> and they had that brilliant idea every Christmas, what a marketing idea. They get, they get small, round, wicker, waste paper baskets. <laughs> fill them full of rubbish, seal it in with a cellophane cover, so that it doesn't run away, and, and we go, I'll buy that, a fiver, yes, please. And you send it to your grandma, who goes, it's a rubbish bin full of rubbish. <laughs> I'll empty that out and start again, shall I? <laughs> what a clever idea. 
But what is myrrh? I think perhaps myrrh is the thing that cows get on their jackets and go, myrrh. <laughs> get that down the cow dry cleaners, will you? Yes, yes, my mad cow, yes. <laughs> or perhaps myrrh was dope. Perhaps that's the word they used for dope, you know, 2,000 years ago. And baby Jesus going, Mao, this is myrrh. Yeah, marijuana, yeah. <laughs> All right, look, 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 I'll, I'll roll some now, shall I? Yeah, look, I can do it now. Yes, I know I've just been born, but I'm good at this. Da, 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 da. Oh, this is good myrrh, this is. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, hey, I've got an idea. Let's start a religion, shall we? <laughs> we'll call it Buddhism. <laughs> Oh, that'll be funny. Da, da, da. Here, pass this round to the cow at the back. <laughs> Moo! Yeah. Oh, I like maps. <laughs> That's what happened. I'm sure of it, yes. I know my onions. Um, they're quite nice to me, my onions. But, uh, so yeah, you know, after all this sort of upbringing, it's a bit odd. So, naturally, as you know, I, I was one of the first men on the moon. In the <laughs> no, remember Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and I was the third man. Remember the other one? You know, I was Anthony Blunt. Um, <laughs> no, because you remember there were, you know, there were three, and and uh, I wasn't actually supposed to be there. It was a bit odd, you know. But I was just wandering around Cape Canaveral. I dropped my contact lens up on the gantry because <laughs> my dog had got up there, you know, and uh, I was doing some hang gliding. And uh, I saw the top of the rocket, and I thought it was one of those toilets you get in the city centres these days, you know. So I was in there taking a dump in a space helmet, and boom, it took off. And under that G-force, you're really empty out, I tell you. And I had, had a lot of jam the night before, so it was rather troublesome. But uh, remember, we landed on the moon, and then we waited quite a bit of time before we went down to the surface. And everyone thought, oh, technical, you know, you know. But it wasn't. In fact, we were inside the lunar module, scribbling away on bits of paper, trying to come up with the line, you know, <laughs> the big line. Because you can't go all the way up to the moon, and a big space rocket get down, land, step down onto the surface, and go, ooh, it's all squidgy. <laughs> You know, you can't, we needed a line. <laughs> and we hadn't thought of this. We just thought, get up there, you know, get everyone alive, you know. And uh, it would slip our mind entirely. In the end, we came up with a good line. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But it took us ages. <laughs> and Neil Armstrong was useless, you know. <laughs> Couldn't even do joined up writing. He was just <laughs> going cat, dog, <laughs> P -I pig, pig, P-I-G, pig, jam, you know. And what he wanted to say was, one small step for man, piece of piss for a frog. <laughs> Hello. And I didn't think that was funny at all. I thought he should come down and go, one small step for man, and another small step for man. And a slightly larger step for man. And then a hop for a man. And then a wave, you know, just goes through all the motions. <sighs> Strange but wonderful time. But since then, you know, I know I've been rather stressed out. It's modern living, it's difficult for me. And the way I deal with stress in, in the modern, you know, thing is uh, I. <laughs> it's not a funny line, but anyway. Um, yeah, do laugh at it. I appreciate that. Uh, I go to my duvet cover, right? And I undo all the little popper points at the bottom of my duvet cover. <laughs> then I get into my duvet cover and I do back up all the little popper points. Because it's so secure in there, isn't it? <laughs> So wonderful, because we used to have sheets and blankets, and we had sheets and blankets. The whole of you know Britain was sheets and blankets, and, and you were making love underneath sheets and blankets. And it was uh, 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 I finished. Have you? Yes, I have. Was it? Did the earth move? No, it didn't do anything really. You know, it was uh, it's horrible, especially if your mum had tucked you in really tight. You know, <laughs> like, I'm sorry she's in here. My, my, mum, you don't live in this house anymore. Sorry. You know, but now duvet, ah, it's a continental thing, and duvet, you can really make love underneath a duvet, it's great, and you can kick it up at the edge, can't you, you know, you can waggle it around and get air going underneath it, you know, and then you wake up your partner in the middle of the night, because you've got all the popper points underneath your chin, and you say, it's supposed to be down the bottom, wake up, come on, shovel it round, shovel it round, and then you get all the popper points down by your feet, and then you're happy, aren't you, all the stripes going that way. It's an essential thing with a duvet. Ah, yes, and I used to be a single duvet person, you know, I, I, 
times when I was starting off, single duvet, single bed, you know, we had relationships, we used to make love, you know, um, that was, well, it's okay, you know, the Heathrow method all stacked up. And, uh, <laughs> and you say, well, I'm going to sleep now and I, and I want a bit of the duvet. <laughs> and there's a big fight, you're ragging over the duvet all night and you have to sleep on one side, you remember that? And you, you're freezing down the top side and you wake up with a cat on your head, you know? <laughs> And I thought, no more, no, no more, no, no, no. Um, it's 1992 around the corner, you know, I gotta get something different. So I thought, not a double duvet, a king size, a really big one. Because I wanted to flap it down, like, you know, on the outside, you want to flap it down so no air gets in. And if there's someone else in the bed, you've got a gap and, and air tends to get in, doesn't it? And, and, and cats, you know. And we don't even have a cat, you know. I just keep knocking on my door, ding dong, all right, come in, here's a cat. We'll get into bed in a minute. So I thought, right, king size do it, that'll do me. So I saved up for eight years, actually. Um, <laughs> longest period of celibacy in between. And then I got it, and I went to wash the king size duvet cover. It was about a year later, you know. Um, well, you don't, do you? You tend not to wash them. You tend to get in the bed and go, no, I can sleep under that. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we don't wear it, do we? No. Especially if it's dark blue and you go, I think that's clean, isn't it? Yeah. Dark blue? And you wash it. Oh, it's yellow. Oh. <laughs> Didn't know. But the word duvet is so great, isn't it? It's a French duvet. You feel you should be going to rest and saying, yes, I'll have the chicken, please. And a bottle of duvet would be very nice. Thank you. Oh, it's all spongy. <laughs> oh, it is a duvet. Oh, yeah. Mm. But, uh, so I, I went to washed the duvet cover and I, and I washed it. And then I went to put the, the, the duvet back into the cover. And it's not like a single one. A single one's quite easy. You go, you've got one corner, you've got another corner. Regle it up and down a bit, do up the popper points, and there it is. You've got your single duvet. But a king size, it's too bloody big, isn't it? It's, you have to go in there with the duvet. I've done this. I've been, you know, you're going, I can't reach it. I'm going to have to go in. Don't do it, you fool. No, I'm going in. I'm go Give me three hours, then call the police, right? Okay? Yeah, I've got my light, I've got my miner's helmet, and I've got my breathing apparatus. <sighs> okay, Jacques Cousteau is giving me helpful hints. Well, go inside and be careful of the Velcro. You'll get caught in the Velcro, and the little fishies get caught in the. Ve Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Well done. Huh? I'm going in there. Here, I'm, I'm inside the duvet now. Oh, the stalactites and stalagmites and, oh, and, and Velcro. All right. And then you get up, you get one corner, yeah? And you've got, I've got a corner. I've got, I'm traversing along the edge of the duvet. Oh, yes, Chris Bonington's here. Hi, Chris. How are you? And he's going up to the summit. Well done, Chris. Ah, oh, duvets, I love it. I love to just get inside, do all the things, and pretend I'm a fried egg. Uh, <laughs> just me and you two, hey? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Still, still that's life. But, um, so my autobiography, you know, it'll, it'll sell well, because I'm gonna buy every book. And, uh, you know, it'll look good. I know, I'll lose a fortune, but, you know, I don't mind. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Good night, and buy the book, thank you. <laughs> And there's, there's a whole audience here at the Zap looking at me with that look that says, what is he on about? <laughs> Eddie's just writing his, his latest book, which is called Ten Years in a Straight Jacket, so buy that when it comes out. This is the end of Club Class. Thank you very much. Good night.